Hello and welcome. I'm Marianne Deffenbaugh. I'm the treasurer of the Oregon Alliance for the National Museum for Women and the Arts, and I want to welcome you. I also want to take a moment to honor and recognize the history of this land and the peoples who were here first. PNCA is located on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and Bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes, of course, who made their homes along the Columbia River. So we had a lot of history before we came, and it, we want to keep that in mind. But to the matter at hand, we are a state committee, the Oregon Alliance, of the National Museum of Women and the Arts, and we support the efforts of the National Museum, which is located in Washington, D.C. And actually, they have a historic building there that they have been working very hard on renovating and had a great capital campaign. And it's opening next weekend if you want to hop a plane and celebrate with them. The museum showcases and collects art by women from all over the world and from various historical periods. With its collections, exhibitions, programs, and online content, the museum seeks to inspire dynamic exchanges about art and ideas. It advocates for better representation of women artists and serves as a vital center for thought leadership, community engagement, and social change. And many of you picked up a magazine. If you are a member of the national organization, you get this magazine in the mail. And they sent us some extras because, of course, that's part of our mission, increasing the membership and awareness about the museum and its mission. So um, this will tell you how to become a member you can always go to the website. And their website is quite good. It has a lot of uh, information about exhibitions and women artists all over. There are about 17 US chapters that represent the museum in various states and cities. And there are about 13, um, at least a dozen foreign countries who have chapters for the museum, which is great. I'm, I'm glad they're taking a global approach to it. So the Oregon Alliance has the mission of extending the goals of the national in the Pacific Northwest with an emphasis on contemporary women artists and regional audiences. One part of our mission is to educate the broader public, that's you and me, about significant issues in art and the slate of lectures we have organized on women in art in the 20th century helps fulfill that goal. Last month, we heard from Prudence Roberts, who gave a great talk about the life and times of Sonia Delaney. Next spring, on March 24th, Sue Taylor will speak about figure painting by Alice Neal. And on Sunday, April 21st, Bruce Gunther, who is here, will talk about Sculptura Assemblage, I always like to say it like it's French, by Louise Nevelson. Today, we are going to hear about the surrealist artist Lenora Carrington, and we're pleased to have Dr. Abigail Sussex, Associate Professor of Art History at Willamette University with us today. She received her BA from Barnard College and her Master's and PhD from Columbia University. Her research in modern and contemporary art focuses on international surrealism and anti-authoritarian protest sculpture, cultures. Pardon me. She's a founding board member of the International Society for the Study of Surrealism and has a number of publications on the subject to her credit. Co-organized with the Tate Modern, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City presented Surrealism Beyond Borders last year, and Abigail was one of the contributors to the catalog that documented that exhibition. She is also the author of a recent book, Surrealist Sabotage and the War on Work, which, by the way, is available on Amazon, should you want to order it, and also directly from the Manchester University Press. Abigail is also co-editor of two books, Surrealism in Film after 1945, Absolutely Modern Mysteries and Radical Dreams, colon, Surrealism, Countercultural Renaissance, two different books. Her reviews and opinion pieces have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, the New York Times, and the Washington Post.
From 2009 to 2011, she was a postdoctoral fellow at Millsaps College. Since her research has been supported by the National Humanities Center, Graves Awards in the Humanities, the IFK International in Vienna, the Mellon Foundation, the Council of Independent Colleges, and the Crystal Bridges Museum. That's quite impressive support. In 2016, she curated a survey of Imogene Cunningham's photographs for the Halley Ford Museum of Art in Salem. And we're so happy to have some people who live in Salem and study in Salem with us this afternoon. She is currently working on a new curatorial project, Touch of the Marvelous, Surrealism and the West Coast. From that research and from her many recent research trips to Mexico comes Abigail's presentation today, which she has titled, Defending the Last Egg. We um, are, I hope you will join me in welcoming our illustrious speaker. Hello, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Marianne, thank you for the delightful introduction. It's so nice to see you all here today, friends and colleagues and neighbors and students. Thank you for coming on this perfect Oregon autumn day. Uh, I am truly delighted to be able to talk to you about Leonora Carrington, and we're going to be doing a kind of general overview, but toward the end of the lecture, I might zoom in on something I've been working on in more detail, depending on how much time we have, um, and we'll be doing questions at the end. Now, how does it sound? Does everything sound okay? All right, let me know if it's starting to sound uh, that you need me to speak up. Um, I would love that. We can go ahead and make it dark. Art historians are more comfortable in the dark. We like, we like to not be seen and have the images be highlighted. But I can take this moment to say thank you so much to Marianne, to Prudence for your great lecture um, that inspired my own. Um, Bruce Gunther's lecture coming up in the spring on Louise Nevelson. Do not miss that. I'm obsessed with her work. Um, and also, um, not to leave out Sue Taylor, who is a dear friend and mentor of mine. I'm delighted with this invitation. I'm excited to be speaking at PNCA and uh, very eager to learn more about the Oregon Alliance for the National Museum of Women and the Arts. So this will definitely be a rich crash course into the art of Leonora Carrington. I'm going to show you quite a few images today. Um, on the left, we're seeing an image that's actually from a theater set design in the 1960s, which we'll return to later. And of course, a very beautiful photograph of Lee Miller, of rather, of Carrington by the female photographer, Lee, Min Me Lee Miller, who you will hear more about. Now, how many of you know something about Leonora Carrington already? I want to gauge my audience's enthusiasm. Okay, quite a few people know a little bit about Carrington. So Carrington is a British artist who uh, is, and ended up her life in Mexico, right? So she moves to Mexico during the World War II era and remains there and becomes a Mexican citizen. And you can see that she had a very long life and that we lost her not that long ago now. She was able to, uh, in the early 2000s, continue painting, continue her career, and we see her pictured here in her home studio in Mexico City, which uh, is in the process of becoming a museum. Now, there's definitely been increasing attention given to Carrington in the last decade or two, and it only seems to get more and more intensive as time goes by. In a sense, I think we're still learning to gauge just how powerful her influence has been. And um, you can see that we have a number of publications here. I won't talk about them all, but you can see a lot of these have only recently been published. Um, this one just came out. It's a graphic novel. Can you see my laser pointer? It's a graphic novel devoted to the life of Leonora Carrington. How cool is that, right? Um, we have a memoir by her son, Gabriel Weiss Carrington, a brand new book by a, a scholar who I have been very inspired by who works on Carrington, Catriona Makara. This just came out. Uh, books on uh, Carrington and the Tarot, um, books on her life, new volumes of her theater and stories in French and coming out in English soon and other books by family members. I've also highlighted here something that you really may have heard about that was definitely in the news, which was the fact that Carrington was sort of the, the rising star, the, if you will, the morning star for the recent iteration of the Venice Biennale, which is a very important contemporary art exhibition that happens every couple of years in Italy. 
And they named it The Milk of Dreams uh, after a book by Carrington that was made for her children in the 1960s. Um, and so that was a really a big deal to have Carrington be the kind of focus of this international exhibition that's so important for contemporary art. Um, now you may also know that Carrington is a, was a prolific author and that her books and stories are incredible. I highly recommend that you delve into them if you haven't already. I'm just giving you a small sampling of some of the covers of English books. M many of her works were published in French and then translated into English, even though she was a native English speaker. She spent a good portion of her life in France, and so she did a lot of her writing in French, but in any case, you can get quite a few older volumes as well as newer um, imprints of her texts and get to know her as a writer as well. And that will come up in my presentation because I'm very interested in her plays and her short stories that in general have been somewhat neglected in her body of work. Um, it's only really, I think, in the last couple of decades that people have begun to understand the way in which her writing affects her painting and her fine arts work, et cetera. Um, she, of course, has been featured in some of the big blockbuster surrealism shows that have been coming out around the world. Uh, I think most prominently recently, she was featured at the Surrealism Beyond Borders exhibition that Marianne mentioned at the Tate and the Met in 21, 22. Um, you can see she's featured here in the catalog in the upper right corner, a self-portrait that we'll look at. And there have been numerous exhibitions um, in recent years around the world, in Denmark and in Spain. Um, and we're just seeing, as I said, increasing attention given to her. I think no longer can we say is she as neglected as she was previously, although I will say we still have a lot of work to do in order to fully understand the scope of her career particularly the second half of her life in Mexico, which is something I hope to speak to today. Now, how many of you got to see this Surrealism Beyond Borders show uh, in, in New York or in London? Okay, not so many people. It was a difficult time to travel, but uh, a really amazing show um, with a great catalog. So my theme of the egg today is certainly inspired by the many artworks uh, that Carrington painted that featured eggs. I'm also thinking a little bit about her theater work especially toward the end of her life when she was writing a play called Opus Siniestris that featured this kind of last egg, the last fertile egg on the planet that would help recreate human life and life itself. So I'll just highlight briefly now the way in which that might play out in an artwork of hers. Um, and then we're gonna delve into a biographical overview of her life so you get more of a sense of who she is. But this is a work from after World War II, when she's living in Mexico. She's a young mother of two sons, and it's called the Garden of Paracelsus. It's a very warm, inviting space, kind of womb-like in itself. And I think you can see at the very center of the canvas, what do we have? We have a beautiful egg that's being carried by a figure wearing kind of diaphanous garb. And this is a very characteristic Carrington uh, canvas, I would say. There's a lot to decipher, a lot of deep detail. It can be a little bewildering. But what I wanted to show you was that a canvas like this that, that is one of so, so many in her prolific body of work is now selling for millions of dollars. This is the highest uh, bid that has come out recently for her work. Recently fetched three, over $3 million on the market. Um, but this is just to give you a sense of the kind of taste for her work and for what she's speaking to, the kinds of issues and themes that she's raising in her work that has become so popular in recent years. And I think actually this focus on uh, fertility, femininity, a kind of mysterious notion of, of the egg as the center of the universe is something that has been very popular in trying to understand the esoteric themes in which she devotes attention. So um, this is, there's an interesting technique here that I wanted to highlight that I enjoyed learning about as I prepared for today. She's using a technique called éclat bossur here, which is a kind of splattering of paint. Do you see that? The wonderful little specks of paint, paint that then get absorbed into the rest of the oil on the canvas, but give it that kind of depth, a little bit uh, sort of added shimmering nature to this, this um, dark ombre canvas, this womb-like space. And She's, this is a, a detail that maybe gives you a little bit of a brighter view. She's interested here in the subject of alchemy, 
which was one of Carrington's dominant concerns, really starting in the 1930s, as soon as she becomes interested in surrealism. She's named this painting after Paracelsus, who was an actual physician and a practicing alchemist, as well as a writer and a philosopher. And I guess he had this amazing theory that the world itself was a kind of egg, that the globe that we are on is the yolk at the center of the world that is surrounded by the shell and the other uh, parts of the egg that encase us in this kind of um, cosmic sphere. It's a very beautiful way of thinking about the universe. And so I think we can get a sense of, of the kind of um, way in which this might relate to celestial themes or even horoscopes as well. I'll go back out to the larger theme. We have uh, black and white pairs intermingling, mixing kind of joyously, but a little bit maybe alarmingly too with heads taken off here, right? Black and white pairs, alchemical themes that uh, hearken to um, Carrington's remarkable knowledge of magic and of, of traditions of, of alchemy, etc. She was interested in the egg on a very personal level. It was starting in the 1940s that she began to think of the egg as a symbol for her own life. She wrote a text called Down Below that I'll speak to more, which was about a very traumatic point in her life. She suffered a mental breakdown, was hospitalized, etc. And she says in that book, the egg is the micro macrocosm and the microcosm, the dividing line between great and small, which makes it impossible to see everything at once, right? And as a new mother of an 11-month-old baby, I kind of get it, <laughs> right, that the egg could be this way of seeing the beginning and maybe the all sense of, uh, of all-consuming nature of the universe. Now, I first got into Carrington and research on Carrington starting in 2014, when I got involved in a book called Leonora Carrington and the International Avant-Garde that was edited by Jonathan Eburn and Catriona Macara, who I've already mentioned. And I was writing a chapter about Carrington's work in Mexico in the 1960s, which at that time there really wasn't that much written about, certainly in English, right? And I was inspired by a really new book at the time that had come out in Spanish, Leche del Sueño, which was the, the Spanish version of that text, The Milk of Dreams, that the Venice Biennale used. And this was a book of drawings and stories that she made for her two sons. And so um, I, I first learned about Carrington and, and enjoyed writing um, about the work that was in this text and, and her collaborations with a journal called Snob. Um, but was very taken with her sense of, of black humor, um, her sense of the kind of fantastic and the terrible and the funny at all at once. And so, for instance, uh, I was writing about stories that were published in this journal called Snob, such as the one about Lolita Barriga, Lolita the Belly, who hates children and entertains herself by feeding rotting meat to unsuspecting niños in order to make them dreadfully sick. <laughs> so I'm telling you a little story. When the three children of the village nearby wander into the woods to play, Lolita accosts them and tries to force them to eat the noxious carnitas that she keeps sealed in a box. <laughs> Planning to lie to Lolita, the children, however, do not eat the disgusting bits of meat which have putrefied to such a point that they are alive once again and can talk. <laughs> when the loquacious meat pieces reveal the deception, the monstrous Lolita furiously dismembers the children, not so fun, <laughs> um, and places their bodies in a parrot cage. The children are discovered by a man who arrives on the scene, taking pity on them, he glues their heads back on their bodies, but unfortunately he does so incorrectly, as I think you can see. So Thomasina's head is glued to her hand, Chucho's under his foot, and the unlucky Vincente finds his head inconveniently attached to his ass. Nevertheless, the three children are contented, contentos to have survived, and there therefore is a kind of happy ending to this gruesome story um, of Lolita Barriga, this hideous giant with a long braid and a shriveled nose and hooped earrings. 
So this, this was for me just the beginning of a long relationship with Carrington. Now that I have a little boy who's 11 months old, I can't wait to read in these stories. Right? Um, but, but truly, um, I, I have been, you know, as Mary Ann mentioned, able to travel quite a bit and learn more and more about Carrington through many voyages to Mexico. Um, since I'm really interested in this second half of her career there. Just last weekend, the International Society for the Study of Surrealism, we hosted an amazing online event with the son and grandson of Carrington uh, talking about Gabriel Weiss Carrington's memoir of his mother. It was really special. So check out the ISSS if you're interested in surrealism in general. But let's go ahead and meet Carrington, whose first name is Mary. Did you know that? And she was born a little over 100 years ago um, in Lancashire in Northwest England, as you may know, to a very wealthy family. And this is an important part of her origin story and an important part of the way in which she makes works of art. And so we can see that these photos look pretty good. Uh, I was scouring the web for you know, high-res images. But we see this um, beautiful child surrounded by her three brothers. She had three brothers. Um, and uh, she was a sort of middle child in their affluent lifestyle there. And um, this one's a bit grainy, but this gives you a sense of her childhood home that she moved into when she was three years old, Crookie Hall, which was a Gothic revival house that featured you know, out outdoor tennis courts and you know, manicured gardens and extended grounds, a billiard room, a conservatory with plants. Um, really uh, an impressive home that was also quite foreboding. She had a nursery there that she was expected to you know, remain in for much of the day. She had a, an Irish nanny who told her you know, quite scary Irish tales. Uh, and Carrington herself was part Irish. Her mother is Irish. Her father is British, um, Protestant. She also had a, a governess, someone who tutored in French. She had a separate religion teacher. I mean, it was really pretty uh, an intense way to be a little girl in this, in this house, which happens now to be a school, a boarding school. Um, it looks a little bit more friendly in the color picture, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, but I don't know if I want to go to boarding school there. Uh, but, but the house um, certainly got into her psyche, although she was still a very little girl when they moved out of that house into another mansion nearby. But I mention this because, because it is, anyway, this sort of setting for the beginning of this imagination, this world of imagination focusing on the self, the self and its dream world, the self and its desire for escape or to flee authority that becomes absolutely central to her work for the rest of her life, in both her writing and her paintings. Um, so I think it's interesting that the house is the same architect that uh, designed um, the Natural History Museum in London. So just to give a sense of how this childhood world is so important to Carrington's work, and I think you can see that that's already a theme that we have with uh, Lolita Barriga and the Carnitas, um, but you can see that this is a print based on a painting from the mid-1940s um, in which she's featuring a kind of generalized memory of one of these childhood homes, one of these Gothic homes. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it looks like it's a little bit scary. <laughs> and Carrington did say that she did have some paranormal experiences in Crookie Hall, as often children do when their imagination is running wild. Um, I think we can see um, what look like maybe wraiths or spirits and all sorts of wonderful animals, maybe slightly scary animals as well. Perhaps we might want to see a self-portrait or a figure in the white figure here. I'm not sure if you would agree with that. I don't want to pin it down with a meaning, but there's all sorts of flying, levitating beings around playing in the house, running around. Carrington herself was interested in levitation as a child. She was interested in spirituality and the occult as a child, um, and to some degree religion. She was fascinated by animals and drawn to them, um, and this also becomes a recurrent theme in her work uh, later on. And so you get a sense that the, the formative years of her life really are a kernel from which she can draw on for this creative reservoir over the course of the many decades of her life. And here are some more photos of her as she matures. When I get to start to tell you about her pretty traumatic school years, 
um, because this is also, I think, part of the myth and of, of the way in which she orients herself as in the world. The family does move to another, you know, very stately mansion, slightly less Gothic, in 1927. But by that time, she's already been put into Catholic boarding school. So she's raised Catholic, following her mother's religion. But it's not going well, right? These are convents. She's working with nuns. She's kicked out almost immediately of the first uh, convent um, because of her basically antisocial behavior probably having to do with her desire to levitate. <laughs> she also could write ambidextrously, which concerned the nuns, and she could write backwards, which they thought was very strange, and they were troubled by this. Um, and so you know, the family take her back, um, and then she's sent off to another convent. The bishop intervenes. That convent also says she's not ready, so a second school she's expelled from. Um, so you can see maybe that this is a child who's negotiating um, some difficult feelings, some feelings of defiance, uh, feelings of discomfort within her sphere. Um, here are her brothers. She was called Prim at home and was quite close to this brother, Gerald, who you can see it looks he's like he's a little mischievous, maybe like herself. Um, uh, but she, she, and this is the nanny. This, I believe, is the Irish nanny here, who was beloved, by the way. Um, so it's been, it's a really sort of difficult time for her. Um, and so the family regroups, and when she's 15, they say, okay, we're going to try another route. No more convents, no more nuns. We're going to send you to Italy, where you will go to a kind of a finishing school for young aristocratic uh, women. And so she is sent to Florence to Miss Penrose's. Uh, it goes a little bit better there. Uh, she's, uh, she's there for uh, about a year, and she gets appendicitis, and then they send her home again. But while she's there, she's able to really enjoy some of the artwork that she can find in Florence. Uh, Renaissance and Quattro Centro work ap appeals to her. And quite interestingly, if you know anything about surrealism, it is actually the very uh, artists that surrealists love that become her fascination from this period. So Uccello is a focus of hers this sort of very flat spaces, right, really prior to the development of One Point Perspective. And of course, Giuseppe Archimboldo with his incredible, um, almost sort of uh, collage heads that are made from fruits and seafood and, in this case, flowers. So um, because Carrington is from new money and is from a very wealthy family, it is expected that she would be presented at the court of the king. She was, the family was really that prominent. Um, dad got his money working um, in the textile industry. He owned mills and employed, you know, million, well, sorry, excuse me, hundreds of workers. And he, um, his father had been working class and had basically invented a part that helped pioneer a new type of fabric. And this is how the family got their money. Um, her mom and dad really fell in love. Her mother was an Irish beauty, and the parents had a true love affair and were very happily married. Um, and her mother, uh, Maureen, or Maury, pictured here, uh, it was really important to Maury that she allow her daughter to take you know, her place in society as you know, a kind of quasi-aristocrat. So even though Maury was from you know, essentially a, a bourgeois Irish family. She had great aspirations for her daughter and her sons. And so Carrington had been having all of this trouble in school. She's already making drawings, by the way, and writing some stories. She had been drawing from a very early age. Um, she, Carrington agrees, Leonora, that she will allow herself to be presented at court, but only if the parents let her go to art school after that. Um, so there's this huge hullabaloo, um, you know, they're new money, they're not aristocrats, so they really take time in preparing their daughter for her debutante ball. She has a ball at the Ritz for her coming out. Um, she uh, visits with, uh, you know, goes into the royal enclosure at the game, you know, race day, etc. She hates it. She's presented at court here at the court of King George V in one of the final sort of debutante coming out uh, ceremonies um, uh, that century. 
Um, and and you know, she hates it so much. She's so uncomfortable, especially wearing this ostrich feather tiara that you can't see in the image, but um, that she is defiant. And she takes a, a Adux, Adux Huxley book, Eyeless in Gaza from 1935, had just come out, and just sits in the corner and reads it <laughs> on one of the occasions. Um, and I hadn't read that text, and it caught my attention. Um, but apparently, it's the story of a kind of coming of age of a, of a young, wealthy man named Anthony Beavis um, who struggles with depression and um, moves toward pacifism and a kind of mysticism um, through his experiences in the Middle East. So maybe not unlike uh, the kinds of things that she was drawn to, which was an escape from her identity, which she, said she found oppressive even though she was enormously privileged. Um, so she gets through all of this. And she gets through the presentation at the court. She does what her parents want her to do. Um, and you know she's still dealing with a, a kind of vibe in the family that she is uncomfortable with. This is a later painting. This is from the 40s after she's become a surrealist. But I think you can get a sense in it. This is a very famous work of the way in which <clears throat> her home life uh, in a very close-knit family became a theme that she would return to over and over. And this is often thought to be a kind of representation of Crookie Hall um, and the, the period in her life when she began to view her father in particular as a problematic authority figure. And this becomes um, something that she will return to in her writing and her paintings. Uh, Green Tea, a really famous work um, from her early period, and she's basically just survived um, trauma from World War II. Often people see this as a kind of self-portrait. I wouldn't maybe go that far, but certainly we see emblems or motifs in the image that are characteristic of Carrington's self-presentation. The white horse is something that she will come back to again and again. She loved horses. She was an accomplished equestrian alongside her mother. She had a pony named Black Bess and uh, a, a chestnut mare named Winky, which I enjoyed reading about. <laughs> uh, so the horse in particular is, uh, is something that will be emblematic of the self, but also people have pointed out the lactating hyena, which is uh, uh, an animal that will show up again later in her stories in particular. This uh, hyena is really chomping at the bit, trying to break away from a constraining leash. The horse seems a little bit more content to stay put, but there is this sort of sense of a ferocious need to move, to, to flee, at least to have some sort of liberating freedom from what looks like a kind of straight jacket. We see other emblems in the painting, something that might come to mind um, when you look at alchemical books. This is almost an alembic or a chemical device in a strange underworld filled with other animals um, in green tea here from 1942 at Museum of Modern Art. But that's a little preview, right? This is, we're still in the kernel of her development. And so the award that she gets uh, for surviving the debutante balls is to go to art school in London. And her parents allow this, but they basically say, you have almost no money. They, they make her survive on next to nothing. Um, she starts at one art school in Chelsea, and then a friend of the family says, hey, why don't you try this other school, the Ozenfant Academy? Um, which was a brand new school run by one guy, Amade Ozenfant, which maybe you've heard of him. And she was the only student for a time. Um, Ozenfant had uh, just emigrated from France. And he was, well, very well known in France as the co-founder of a movement called Purism. Have you heard of it before? He worked closely with Le Corbusier, if you've heard of that architect and designer. And so he became her teacher. This is a canvas by him on the right. Um, I think you can see that the style is pretty darn different. It's a still life, essentially, very exacting, very controlled, which was sort of um, embodied the ideals of this purist movement. They wanted a very streamlined kind of ge geometric abstraction, even while it was based on representational objects. So he apparently was a really strict teacher. But for the first time in her life, Carrington liked that. Right, so it, unlike the nuns at, at the convents she had been at, she really enjoyed that Ozenfant made her draw an apple for six months. And apparently, it was the same apple over and over. It just got more and more shriveled as time went by. 
So this is a, a very difficult to find example of some juvenilia painting from this era by, um, by Carrington. We're in the mid 30s. She's 19 years old, basically um, doing a kind of gestural style as a very young artist in training um, at this time. So I know we're moving kind of rather quickly through time, but <clears throat> we're getting to the formative events of her emergence as an artist into the 20th century sphere. Um, a few felicitous things happen. Her mother, who she remained close with all her life, by the way, gave her a copy of this book um, in 1935, 36, which had just come out. It was a book by a very distinguished British art historian named Herbert Reed, who was collaborating with the Surrealist Movement, which was an international art movement, in order to bring about the first exhibition of Surrealism in London, or in the UK, anywhere. And so it was a book, um, it's very beautiful and expensive now, unfortunately for me, but uh, that featured, you know, Reed's writings as well as those of Surrealists themselves. Um, and he said things like, the Surrealist movement was a revolution directed at every sphere of life, encompassing politics and poetry as well as art, its purpose, the liberation of resources of the subconscious mind. So pretty on point as a definition of surrealism. He was, though, also a little bit of, of reserved about the movement. He also said things like, do not judge this movement kindly. It is not just another amusing stunt. It is defiant the desperate act of men too profoundly convinced of the rottenness of our civilization to want to save a shred of its respectability. They want to transform the world. Um, and so I won't say a lot about surrealism, but if you don't know much about it, it is uh, a very, um, I would say, long-lasting art movement that is still alive today with groups around the world. It begins in 1924 in Paris with this rather dapper crowd. They, a lot of them are veterans of World War I, and they're interested in the writings of Sigmund Freud and the development of psychoanalysis. So they form a group, and they get an office, and they start investigating the activity of the mind as a way of creating art, uh, as a way of revolutionizing art and life. So you have the Surrealist Manifesto by one of the key writers and members of the group, André Breton, um, which talks about, as you can see, um, understanding the world of the mind as a for, sort of superior reality. He talks about the omnipotence of the dream and the disinterested play of thought. He wants to do away with other psychic mechanisms and substitute surrealism for them in the solution of the principal problems of life. So literally, the surrealist thought that if you could access your dreams, if you could actually bring your dreams into your daily life, you could change not only your individual life, but but society itself. They were uh, not at all, um, you know, mincing words. They were very serious about this. So they practiced something called automatism, in which they had a kind of stream of thought or um, unconscious sort of spewing of language, uh, ideally uh, in their minds directly from the unconscious, as if that was possible. And they, someone here is dictating from the dream world directly to, of course, a female typist, a member of the group. Um, and they defined surrealism as this kind of automatism, which meant that they would shut down the conscious mind. They would become automatic. The body would become an automatic machine, in a way, for performing this kind of living dream or waking dream. They wanted to, as you can see, find the real functioning of thought, the dictation of thought in the absence of all control, exercised by reason and outside of all aesthetic and moral preoccupation. Um, and this was their rallying cry for the next, uh, at this point, 100 years. And they had a journal called The Surrealist Revolution in which they attempted to bring these theories into the political realm, sometimes successfully and sometimes not very successfully. They say on the cover of this issue from 1924, it is necessary to arrive at a new declaration of human rights based on this idea of the unconscious mind, repressed thoughts, et cetera, saving the world. And so 
So Carrington might have gotten a little glimpse of that in this book, <laughs> but what was really key for her um, was the fact that she was able to visit this first Surrealist exhibition in London. Um, and there are lots of juicy anecdotes from this event, and maybe some of you know some of them. Uh, this is the most well-known one, and uh, Matthew, I have a Dali scholar in the room who might know about this uh, event, the lecture for the authentic paranoic phantom by Dali. Uh, you can't see him because he's in the diving suit. Um, it was uh, a lecture in which he was holding two dogs on leashes in one hand and a pool stick in the other hand. Uh, the lecture was inaudible because he was in the diving suit, so someone sat at the front of the room translating. Meanwhile, Dali couldn't breathe in the suit, so over time he started to make more and more frantic gestures. <laughs> I'm, this, I'm claustrophobic, so it makes me <laughs> really anxious to talk about it. And so finally they had to use the pool stick to pry off the top and let him out. After which he recovered and continued the presentation with the slides upside down. So well, we won't do that today. <laughs> um, but there was a, a great participation from the French group, from international members of Surrealism. Um, as you could see, that you had a thousand people at the opening night, and then over the course of three weeks, like you know, twenty to thirty thousand people visiting the show. It was a big deal. Max Ernst, who will uh, feature shortly in our discussion, designed the poster, kind of a tame poster for surrealism, if you ask me. Um, and then here's a, a nice shot of some of the participants of the group, including some of the British surrealists who were just in formation as a collective at this time. Um, a number of female artists were members of the British Surrealist group and made very important contributions. Um, certainly, maybe you've heard of Eileen Agar here and Sheila Lega. Uh, Sheila became well known for a performance uh, that was part of the opening night of this beautiful exhibition, um, which involved a costume that she made uh, that uh, covered her head entirely with flowers. Um, and she carried in one hand a pork chop uh, but sometimes she alternated that uh, with a fake leg, a prosthetic leg, because I guess it was kind of a hot day and the pork chop was a little stinky. So, um, But you can see there were a lot of female artists featured in the show for this era. And this is something I've tried to highlight in my lecture is not just Carrington's work, but also the importance of other female artists to her career. So because of this, this interest in surrealism and the arrival of her um, knowledge in London through Amédée Ozenfant to this movement, she becomes very interested in the work of Max Ernst, who was one of the most prominent, prominent surrealists. He was a German who was living in France, and by this time in his mid-40s was already a world-famous artist. I bet some of you have heard of him before. Um, and he had 16 works on display at that show, she was able to see in the book by Herbert Reed this work by Ernst that she became quite obsessed with. Two children are threatened by a night nightingale, which was made during the initial year of the Surrealist movement. She said it sort of spoke to her as if she already knew it before she saw it, or she already knew the artist before she was able to meet him. Um, the two children here who are menaced by a nightingale in a nightmarish scene of violence, but also a kind of inviting, fantastical scene with assemblage elements. As you can see, there's a real gate that opens and a, a little knife affixed over here. Very, very strange work um, that would characterize Ernst's early surrealist period and also influence her. But it was so influential for her that it actually led her to seek out Ernst because she realized she had a connection that would allow her to meet him. This is the theory that she actually attempted to reach out herself rather than a, a fortuitous meeting with him. He, he was back in London in 1937 for his own solo show and was staying with some friends that had a connection to Carrington. And so a dinner party was set up. This is sort of quite famous in the history of her work. This is one of his collages, by the way. And they met um, <clears throat> and fell in love immediately. Now, the problem was is that Ernst was married. <laughs> um, he was 26 years her elder. That wasn't a problem uh, for her. Um, but it was a little bit problematic that he, that he was still married to Marie Berthe Orange, who was a French artist. Um, and you can see a work of hers here in which she collaborated with her husband, 
Ernst, um, which is a portrait of André Breton, one of the key surrealists, as I've mentioned, from 1930. Um, it was not going well with their marriage. Let's just they were sort of separated. They weren't talking. Marie was very anxious. Um, Ernst was doing whatever he could to stay away from her. Um, and so when he meets Carrington, uh, he is able... Um, in his own mind to move directly forward into this relationship with this very, very young woman. Now, the other problem was is that, uh, well, Carrington's parents. <laughs> when Carrington's parents got word of this, they actually tried to have Ernst arrested for pornographic art and kicked out of England. It didn't work. Um, but when they heard of this, this brand new couple uh, flee to the north of England with a group of surrealists where they have a kind of wild surrealist party for two weeks. And many, many beautiful photographs are taken of this initial period in their relationship, um, especially by Lee Miller, who is one of the great photographers of surrealism and one of the great women photographers of the 20th century. I think there's a movie being made about her right now. Yeah, she's extraordinary. Um, so Lee is here. This is a portrait by someone she had just fallen in love with, Roland Penrose, a surrealist, but this is Carrington with other female surrealists such as Nush Eloward and, and Adi Fidelin, um, who were partners of male surrealists, but surrealists in their own right. So, so this is a really exciting time in Carrington's life, and um, I think you could see it's a, it's a time of great change um, and, and of, of really, in some ways, of, of never looking back because what happens is when she decides to leave England for France, her father uh, is against this and fights it. And he says, we're cutting you out of the family, money included. And she never sees her father again. So the family lets her go. But this is a, a work from just after this period. Right, These are her, her initial surrealist years, a famous self-portrait, the Inn of the Dawn Horse, and look who we see again. Do you recognize the figures from Green Tea? Yes, we have the white horse who has escaped out the window and fled. We have the lactating hyena. Uh, and I'm a breastfeeding mother, so I find this, she's just very adorable to me. And I like her strength and ferocity. Um, very close to the artist whose hair is untamed and wild. She's wearing riding pants. She almost seems to echo the form of the white horse. She's giving the sign of malediction right, a sign, basically a kind of a cursing this house, in my opinion. This is a curse on Crookie Hall, a curse, a, a curse on the family, um, a curse on the way in which she was raised. We see a rocking horse, which will come again and again into the work, and which you saw on the first slide uh, of today. Um, so a very, very powerful work that looks toward her interest in childhood themes and stories like The Oval Lady, which I've highlighted here, the Oval Lady um, is a collection of stories, but there's also a story called The Oval Lady that talks about familial relationships and childhood, features a rocking horse that is a sort of magical creature. Um, and this is uh, something that you can see. Carrington bought one of these for her new flat in Paris, her new apartment with her lover, Max Ernst, is really important to her uh, development. So a, a glimpse at this, the earliest surrealist Carrington now, I'm going to look at the time and see. I think we started a little bit late. Is that right? OK. Um, so we're now in Paris. She has definitively left England and abandoned her life as a member of the prestigious and wealthy Carrington family. She's in her early 20s, and she's living in Paris with Max Ernst and is able to visit and take part in the brand new Surrealist exhibition that was hung in 1938 and curated by the illustrious artist Marcel Duchamp, who made a strange cave-like space with sacks of coal, coffee constantly cooking so you could smell coffee, um, strange sounds being played on phonographs. Matthew, this is for you again. There is also uh, works by artists like Dali, such as the Rainy Taxi, which was a kind of proto-installation piece, if, if you know what that might be, a sort of space, a, a work that takes up space in the room. It actually had water running down the sides of the taxi and live snails floating all over the mannequins inside. I think you can see a snail here. Um, lots of really important works to talk about, but certainly Carrington would have been totally wowed by this. There was a street of surrealist mannequins, and Ernst, interestingly, had a mannequin featured. His mannequin was a beautiful young woman with a veil, and at her feet 
was a man with white hair, not unlike his own, laying at her feet prostrate as she overpowered him. And she said about surrealism at this time, the women surrealists were considered secondary to the male surrealists. The women were considered people there to inspire, aside from doing the washing, cooking, cleaning, and feeding. I never thought of myself as a muse. I thought of myself as being carried away by my lover. And then she also said, once you were 25, you were pretty well out of the group, which is uh, a huge critique of the movement and a very important thing to recognize. She might have been influenced by performances by female surrealists, such as Helen Vanell, who did this remarkable dance called L'Hysterie, Hysteria, at the opening night of the performance, as you can see, extremely dramatic kind of reenactment of mental illness um, as a form of art. Surrealists were really interested in hysteria. And Carrington herself had two works featured, which is a lot, considering she's just emerging as a painter, right? Ernst is actually actively teaching her how to paint. He's continuing, in a sense, the education that Ozan Font had started. And this is one of the works included. The horse is a theme again. Now remember, the horse is not just an animal for Carrington. The horse is part of her childhood. And so I think we can say the, the juvenilia obsession of the horse remains here in Horses of Lord Candlestick, which is fascinating. It was purchased by Peggy Guggenheim the great collector and founder of the Guggenheim Museum, Peggy came to visit Max to buy a work. Instead of leaving with a Max Ernst, he bought a Carrington. Oh, she bought a Carrington, excuse me. This is the other work that was featured in the 1938 International Surrealist Exhibition in Paris, a really strange canvas. When André Breton, the surrealist, started, st surrealist, saw it, he said, what a desire for extravagance. It's a cannibalistic scene of female creatures, monstrous creatures who are eating all sorts of animals who still seem to be a little bit alive, including this sort of skeleton of a bird that is sitting up in its plate, um, flamingos, and a live baby. Um, we have servant figures coming in and out and a strange, huge face of a father figure overlooking the activities here. Um, she says, even at this point in time, I was never with a surrealist, I was with Max. So uh, I think in order to understand this transition in her work and this period of her development, we must know that the early experiences of her life are just as important as what she was being exposed to in Paris with the surrealists, right? And with her love affair with Max Ernst, which was pivotal for her. She also begins to publish at this time uh, texts such as The House of Fear and Max Ernst provides collages and prefaces for them. I'll show you another one very quickly. This is The Oval Lady that some of you may have seen some of these texts. This is a, you can buy this in translation and read some of these great stories. You can see how productive this period was for her um, despite the changes in her life, 1938, 39 just a few years after departing from art school in London, she is a published surrealist. So I'm gonna take us up to her period in Mexico, so I think we have just enough time for that, but I wanna tell you briefly about the transition in her life out of Europe, essentially. Um, now this is a period that a lot of people focus on when they talk about Carrington because it's very dramatic. I'm actually gonna gloss over it. What happens is that uh, Ernst and Carrington are having trouble with Ernst's wife. And so they decide to leave Paris and go out into the country where they can be alone. They buy a little house in the country in Provence, um, a house that is actually still there. It's in southern France. And they live there in great harmony and happiness, by all counts, for about a year and a half. They decorate the house. They decorate the walls of the house. I know this is not a great image, but it just gives you a sense of Max um, putting the figures on the house that are still there. Carrington also contributes to this um, by making figures such as horse figures and the exterior of the house. But as you can see from this previous slide, uh, unfortunately the happiness is short-lived because what happens? World War II breaks out, right? And Max Ernst, being German, is sent to an internment camp as an enemy of the French state. And so, um, although they had had this glorious time visited by friends such as Lee Miller, who photographs Carrington again at the house in Saint-Martin-Dardèche, 
Uh, also an artist named Leonor Feni, who was an Argentinian Italian artist of great importance, who also had an ambivalent uh, relationship to the Surrealist movement, did a portrait of, of Carrington uh, a little bit later on, but she had visited the house and, and become very close with Carrington, despite the fact that she previously had been Ernst's lover as well. But it had been a, a really special time for Carrington, and um, uh, when um, Max is imprisoned, she uh, is very troubled. Uh, Carrington increasingly becomes depressed um, and anxious. Max Ernst is in internment camps for about a year, and then by that time, Carrington had already fled their little country house and gone to safety, well, what she thought was safety in Spain. Ernst, meanwhile, makes his way to France, and they're all attempting to flee Europe and, and the Nazi onslaught. And so Ernst um, uh, is able to stay in this house in Marseille, the Villa Arabelle, um, with the help of someone named Varian Fry, who's helping basically to get people out of Europe, get away from the Nazis. And uh, if you want, there's a not very good show on Netflix um, that features uh, this period and also shows a Max Ernst character flapping around as a bird in a bird costume. I, I'm not really a fan, but um, it's fun if you want to watch it. Um, um, but there's some interest in this period. Uh, uh, Transatlantic is the name of the show. Um, so Carrington uh, goes to Spain and uh, um, unfortunately increasingly uh, suffers from her agitation, her anxiety, and has a full-scale nervous breakdown, is admitted to an asylum in Spain where she is treated with a, a traumatic drug called cardiazole, that acts like a kind of shock therapy treatment. She is not given shock therapy, to my knowledge, but given a drug that is essentially for schizophrenics. It is horrendous for her. She is also the victim of a sexual assault at this time, and so um, has really, for her in her life, the greatest trauma of her life in this period. And I think you can see that reflected in a painting such as Map of Down Below, which is the kind of counterpart to the text she writes just a couple of years later that we've heard from, called Down Below, which is the narrative of this descent into mental illness, her uh, absolutely horrific treatment, and how she recovered from it. It was published in 1944. So she makes it to New York, despite, against all odds, she flees from the mental asylum. Her family was attempting to ship her off to South Africa, where she would have been uh, put in another hospital. She actually runs away. Uh, she has to flee again and makes it to New York with the other Surrealists where she is celebrated by Peggy Guggenheim and the male Surrealists as a member of the group, an important member of the group, alongside, you can see Max Ernst, and I'll mention that in a minute, but people like Marcel Duchamp, Pete Mondrian, etc. It's really remarkable. Uh, she was taken very seriously by the group, even if she also found the group problematic. Now what happens is the trauma is so bad that Ernst and Carrington can no longer pursue their relationship. She moves away from Ernst um, in a very conscious manner. Meanwhile, he marries Peggy Guggenheim um, for complicated reasons. She is, uh, had been able to escape to the United States by marrying someone named Renato Leduc, who was a Mexican ambassador. And it's thanks to Leduc that she goes for the first time to Mexico. Um, where she will stay for the remainder of her life with trips to back to Europe and to the United States and brief periods of living in the United States. But thus begins a new era in her life uh, in which she's able to thrive in many ways and she really falls in love with Mexico. Um, she meets surrealists such as Remedios Varro and Benjamin Pere, the Spanish and French surrealists who are a couple at this time. She marries a photojournalist, uh, uh, Vice, who had worked with Robert Capa during the Spanish War as a photo assistant. He's a photojournalist. Chiqui Vice, they called him. And then she has two sons um, in the 40s. So you see she's able to recover. Um, now, if you're interested in Remedios Varro, who's an incredible artist, there's a show up in Chicago right now that I really want to see. And I hear Sue Taylor as seeing, is seeing as we speak. So we're going to wrap up here, and this is my last way of talking to you about the theme of defending the last egg, which is a part of her work for the rest of her life. And 
I had been thinking about talking to you about theater works and plays in the 60s and 70s, but opted for this overview instead because I knew that so many of you might not know much about her work. But the egg is here. Can you see it? I'll go a little bit closer in a minute. It's a strange sort of black egg. But I think we can say, see in this work, The Guardian of the Egg from 1950, that the entire figure is like an egg herself, right? She's like a shimmering goddess egg figure. And I've brought in the quote again that I started with, except I gave you a little bit more extended text here. This is that quote from down below, which was the narration of her mental illness during World War II. And you can see it's, just, it's still written in the midst of the war. She's still recovering, really, from what had happened. This morning, the idea of the egg came again to my mind, and I thought that I could use it as a crystal to look at Madrid in those days of July and August of 1940. For why should it not enclose my own experiences as well as the past and future history of the universe? Again, the egg is the macrocosm and the microcosm, the dividing line between great and small, which makes it impossible to see everything at once. Now, it's interesting to note that guardian of the egg, or the giantess as it's also called, is done in egg tempera, which is uh, a medium that uh, allows for a kind of um, flat optic with the paint, and also it's very fast drying. It was a favored medium of the Quattrocento, actually, in Italy, which she so loved. And I'll go a little bit closer now. Uh, well, actually, I put in a Bosch. She's influenced here, also speaking of the Quattrocento of, of Bosch um, and using egg-like figures as motifs in a painting like this, like the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch from the 1400s, early 1500s. We can see that egg-like forms are everywhere um, as a motif and as a kind of architectural or structural phenomenon. She keeps that here, but in a much more pared down, I think mystical way, that is a meditation for me on femininity and feminine fertility. Um, and this is the era in which, uh, 1950, she's a, a mother of very young children, two young boys. And she said of that part of her life, I've always continued to paint even when the children were very small, only when they were ill, I dropped everything and my children became my priority. But I often said to my friend Remedios, Remedios Varro, we need a wife like men have so we can work all the time and somebody else can take care of the cooking and the children. <laughs> um, so I just, I just want to say that Carrington was very conscious of a kind of, um, I would say, dialectic in her understanding of what the egg could mean in her work. I think the giantess here is defending an egg. This is a precious seed of life and possibility for the future. She's protecting it, certainly. But then again, she's also sort of sharing it with the world, and the world is encompassing that space, right? We have birds flying out of her cloak. She looms over the horizon where people are sort of happily hunting or talking to their loved ones. The ships are sailing by, and the world seems to be harmonious. Uh, thanks to her presence um, and her protection of, of this egg in her protective veils and her shimmering golden hair. This is really a message about the mother goddess or the notion of a cosmic mother that will remain important in her work for the rest of her life, right? For the next few decades of her very long life. And it is a text like The White Goddess by Robert Graves that she had just read in this period that is directly influencing her. In the rest of my work, what I'm focusing on lately is this idea of uh, a kind of political fertility or what you might call an eco-feminism because it is later on that Carrington becomes involved in the feminist movement and its specific relationship to ecological preservation or the kind of resistance to ecological destruction. I think you can just see the beginnings of that in a work like this, like The Giantess, where we kind of get a sense of what we need to protect what's at stake, what possibilities could be, um, and uh, the importance of the female in all of those issues. So thank you very much for listening. And um, I think we can leave the lights down in case people want to look at images for questions. Is that okay, or would you like them up? I think it's better to have the images if you don't mind. I hope we have lots um, of questions.
And I have a few other slides from Testing. later on. If anybody wants to see any of that, we can go to that. Well, we have our first question here. Yeah. Yay, Prudence. Um, um, I was, it's, it's been a while since I've thought about this, but Hildegard of Bingen and the Egg is something that came to mind. Her, her idea of the universe as being mm -hmm. an egg in, enclosing everything, and I'm, I don't, I did, did, Dorothy, would Dorothy have known anything about Hildegard of Bingen? Yeah, I'm sure she did. She was so well read. Yeah. And her, uh, some of her library still exists in Mexico City. You can actually see, is it, should I speak in here? Okay, you can see the books if, if you're able to access that space. Um, she read widely, uh, you know, as she, starting from her childhood, so I'm sure she knew of it. I don't know in particular. But I'm guessing that that canvas with the Paracelsus, which I don't know right. if I'm able to yeah. return to, might have been, um, you know, a kind of nod to that. And I, I don't know if Hildegard was getting that from Paracelsus or maybe the other way around, which would be really cool. Um, but she's certainly interested in, in female mystics of all kinds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a really a widespread mysticism. That's one of the th things that she likes about uh, graves is that it's a kind of, uh, you know, kind of world consideration of the goddess figure throughout history. Mm -hmm. And so she's thinking a lot about Mayan and Mesoamerican uh, female deities at this time when she's, she's in Mexico. But before that, it's Irish deities. So I think it's very likely with her interest in uh, medieval history and art that she would have known, but I don't know for certain. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. See if I can go to the Paracelsus. Could you briefly cover the rest of her life and what she did? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's, there's so much, everybody. Um, well, I don't know how long the Q&A can go, but um, what happens, you know, it's actually, the, the, often I think the reason that you hear about Carrington's, the first half of her life is because the events happen, you know, bam, 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 kind of like a novel, uh, in, some, in some ways a very uh, tragic novel for her. But when she gets to Mexico, her life settles down. I mean, she's a mother, and so she's there. She stays there. She does travel sometimes. But she, um, she gets, I'm, I'm very involved in that period, uh, extremely interested in working with Mexican um, you know, the Mexican culture there and the Mexican crowd. So in particular, what I mean is her, uh, let's look at this image of her. I'll kind of go through my other slides. I brought in many slides. Uh, um, she becomes involved with a, a new generation of Mexican artists and creators. She, um, she's this, I mean, she's a, a young mom here. Um, look at the kitty, it's a very beautiful little kitty cat. She's painting actively, even though she's a mother and as a young mother myself, I get it. She probably did it in the middle of the night. Um, and, and you can see from this great, great quote here, she was absolutely determined to keep going. Um, she starts to befriend really influential people like Edward James who give her, help her with some money and help her get recognition outside of Mexico as well as inside of Mexico. James was a wealthy patron, a very important person in the history of surrealism. Um, he had his own kind of relationship to Mexico with this incre incredible site that I can't go into right now, but if you would like, I can talk about it. Uh, Helitla, Las Posas, I was there not that long ago, a very difficult journey. Um, but she, she starts collaborating with you know, Mexican intellectuals and artists, as well as people who have traveled to Mexico to live, because Mexico's immigration rules are extremely um, open in this era, especially during the World War II era. She works closely with Alejandro Jodorowsky, who um, is a playwright at this time and a mime, becomes a filmmaker. She collaborates with um, uh, uh, the young intellectuals who create this journal, Snob. Um, she's very influential for the younger Mexican generation. She starts to publish more of her plays, and she's painting like crazy, right? So she does get into, with, uh, with Alejandro, I'll go forward, um, into theater design. This is not a great image, I'm sorry. These images are really rare. But a play that she had written in the 40s, Penelope, becomes produced by Hodorowsky in the 60s. Um, and, um, and she also works on other plays like Opus Siniestris, which is a play about the end of the world and the death of uh, female fertility. Um, so these, you know, really the themes never stop. Um, she does this, the Opus Siniestris is in collaboration uh, with artists in New York, so she's going back and forth between New York and Mexico. Um, and, and I think just beginning to gain some notoriety for her work outside of Mexico starting in the 70s. So 
Um, but she, you know, she dies in 2011. And so you have generations of artists who are influenced by her, historians going to visit her. I've met many of them who knew her well. Um, and she's, I think, living rather contentedly in Mexico, just working her butt off for decades, um, uh, you know, into the 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera. Um, her health was quite good, I think, until the very end. Does that help a little bit? Okay, good. I'll show you some other images as we chat. Okay, the question is, at what point did she re-engage with her mother and brothers? So from what I understand, she never fully broke with her mother, Maury. They remained close, although they didn't see one another that often, especially after she moved to Mexico. Now, I've read that Maury did get to visit her uh, in France at one point, and, you know, when she was still there, which wasn't very long, um, and that the, uh, that I, I believe she never saw her father again, from what I understand, after the horrific break between them and basically being kicked out of the family. Let's go back to an image of the, of the family. The brothers, um, you know, I mean, she was sort of this mystical figure. So if you, uh, Joanna Moorhead, who is a cousin of Carrington's, has just published a second book about her memories of her aunt, Carrington, um, who she got to know at the very end of, Car of Leonora's life. Um, and so there, are, there probably is surely some new information about the family there. That book just came out. I haven't read it, but there's a prior one uh, called Surreal Lives that I can go back to um, that can tell you a lot about that period. But uh, Joanna Moorhead says that Leonora, this is the new one, and this is the prior one that's been out for a little while by Joanna Moorhead. Joanna Moorhead says that the that they basically knew nothing about her, that she was the black sheep. They heard some crazy stories, the kids, and they, they, the brothers never really didn't see her much. I think she might have seen one of the brothers once after that. But um, you know, she just wasn't traveling to England and Europe. She would go to the United States. She lived in Chicago for a while. I think she did make uh, a trip or two, but um, she wasn't interested in reconnecting with the family. I mean, it, it was really bad for her what happened. So. Um, but she, with her own family, with her son, um, her sons rather, she was extremely close-knit and had a wonderful relationship with them, collaborated with her sons um, over the course of her life, life, and I know that they, they miss her really terribly. I think I have the image of Gabriel um, and, and Daniel Weiss, her grandson, somewhere in here. Yeah, there they are. And so you can read Gabriel's memoir, which is amazing, to, to find out a little bit more about what it was life to ha like to have Leonora Carrington as your mother. Yes. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Thank One you. is, is the lactating hyena oh, a friendly beast or a threatening <laughs> beast? <laughs> is the lactating hyena a friendly beast or a, what was it? Threatening. Threatening beast, what a beautiful question. Now the art historian and me and the teacher would like to say to you, what do you think? <laughs> but um, uh, I won't do that. Um, no, again, I mean this theme of defense or protectiveness I think is really, important in my mind. Um, in my lecture, I'm definitely inclined to lean that way. So I see her as ferociously protective, if that makes sense. Um, as a mother, right, she would definitely have something to fight for. If she's lactating and chained up, she's going to have to get away from that tree, right? She needs to get back to her babies, so she'll do anything to do that. So she's ferocious about that in order to protect her family. Uh, does that... that seem to ring true for you? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, let's, uh, and that's of course an interpretation. We don't have a, a guidebook for this painting. But it's interesting that, that, you know, is the hyena snarling to get away or is the hyena snarling at this figure and this, this very strange object? Maybe a little bit of both. We can go, let's go to the green tea, uh, to uh, the self-portrait rather, and look at that for a second where we have another hyena. Here we go. Looks, uh, this hyena looks a little more bright-eyed. <laughs> She's not chained up. She's free, and, and uh, free at least within the space of the room, but it looks like if she needed to, she could leap right out the window. I mean, I think in general, Carrington said of hyenas, she really liked them. She said, I like that they eat garbage. She said she related to that kind of bricolage aspect of, uh, of a hyena's identity. Um, and, and she liked the, the sort of conglomerate of aspect of their bodies 
and she liked their ferocity as well. I think that was very important to her. So I think, I think we should outline the ferocious, but maybe see under certain circumstances that, that the intensity of that creature might also be benign or powerful. Hmm. My other question is, did she have anything to do with the Bloomsbury group? I've never heard that. Um, I don't believe that she did. You know, she wasn't in London very long. I think mm -hmm. she was in London for about a year before she fled with Max Ernst. And the family was a little uptight, her family, <laughs> I think. Yeah. So um, she would not have been able to have any kind of bohemian experiences before London. In London, she felt immense freedom and, and befriended people like Stella Sneed, who's an artist. She really enjoyed her time in London, even though she had literally nothing to eat but eggs, actually. She talks about that, cooking, cooking eggs all the time. She was really poor. Um, the family wasn't supporting, on her, supporting her, even though they were constantly checking on her. She had someone once a week come to kind of spy on her. Um, but I've never, I've never heard that. But it's possible, especially because if she was, you know, I mean, we, I think experts now do agree that she attended the, uh, the first international exhibition in London. And if that was the case, certainly some of those members of that group would have visited this. I mean, it was, you know, we had thousands of people visiting, so it's possible. Yeah, yeah in my reading, I came across her name in reading about the Bloomsbury group. Oh, what did you find out? That's wonderful. Just that they didn't think very much of her. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe that was later on, um, after she had begun to publish in, in the 30s or something? Yeah, that's, they didn't like her. That makes sense in a way. <laughs> um, thank you. Very interesting. Any other questions? Alchemy. Alchemy, okay, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is it? How does it work? Let's see if... Um, why don't we go to the Paracelsus image again? Okay. So alchemy, as you probably know, Bruce, is, was a fascination of the Surrealists in general. And they start writing about alchemy in the early 1930s. I think right, on, right at 39, 29, 30 is when alchemy becomes a subject in Surrealist texts. Why is this the case? Um, this is a very complex subject, but I think Surrealists thought of themselves as alchemical and in the sense that they wanted to transform the world. Of course, alchemy is a, is a science of transformation. You transform base metals into gold. And by doing so, you transform your base humanity into a kind of higher consciousness, right? There's a spiritual aspect to alchemy. And I am by no means an, an expert on alchemy. But surrealists use this phrase all of the time. Breton would quote it. He said, change life, transform the world. So change life is from Karl Marx. And I'm sorry, Change Life is from Arthur Rimbaud, Transform the World is from Karl, Karl Marx. They wanted to have a political, poetic transformation of the world. Now, Carrington's interest in alchemy probably went to a much more specific level of an interest in magic. And I know that some of you in the room are inclined to uh, focus on her occult expertise. Carrington, by the 1950s, is a practicing occultist to some degree. She certainly is a uh, practitioner of the tarot, and by the 50s, an expert in it, which is the reason that Alejandro Hodorowsky seeks her out. I think that alchemy for her um, is partly about feminine creation and procreation. Um, that's also a personal theory, um, and that there might be a way in which the use of art and magic to, to manipulate life was of great interest to her, specifically after her breakdown. I believe that some of the supernatural experiences she had as a child were exacerbated during the breakdown and her traumas in that era, and that magic became a way of, of managing, controlling, and manipulating the world in a proactive, uh, agentic manner and with agency and power empowerment, essentially. But I would also like to know what you think. <laughs> I'm also curious, with a Jewish husband, uh -huh. is the Talmudic or the Zubuka yeah. and those, that mythos that comes out of Yes. OK, so yes, Chiki Weiss uh, is a Hungarian Jew, her husband. And um, let's see if I can find Chiki's picture here. And her uh, sons, of course, are part Jewish, therefore. This is Chiki. 
And, but I think even if it wasn't for Chiki, she definitely was interested in the Kabbalah. And she, there, I mean, and Ramiro Savaro too, in the works there are aspects of Jewish mysticism. I mean, the, um, she's really syncretic in her, in her approach to the occult and the magical. And let's see if I could pull up something here. I mean, there's, there's a way in which she's constantly, this is another famous painting, constantly, um, you know, showing in the space of one painting European magical traditions, Mesoamerican are very, very prominent. Um, medieval traditions with modern traditions. And so um, I think that uh, I don't have anything really specific to say about Jewish mysticism, but I know that, that she read it and was interested, if that helps. It was part of that lore for her. We can go, maybe. I don't think too many of these other images would focus on her interest in magic, but um, you probably know that the, there's a recent publication on Carrington and the Tarot that got a lot of interest. And um, I myself am working on a text uh, about Carrington, Hodorowsky, and the Tarot, because the Tarot is very important for him. The Tarot deck, of course, the cards. Thank you. Any other questions? Great lecture. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great Sunday. And if you have more questions, we can always do it up here. <laughs> I hope I didn't go too long, did I? Okay. I actually didn't look at the start time. So. Okay, Lisa, hi, Perry. Thank you.